like, it was now, so I really need to get back. I didn't know any of the comments. Yeah, it's a shame. Yeah, it's a shame. It's a shame. It's a shame. She's Agatha, she's a clock, and she will scuttle. Does, does a tortoise scuttle? Oh. <laughs> Walks graciously, majestically along, and she will keep us in time. So when she gets to the other end, she'll wave her flag in the air, and that means that time's up, and Nikki will do her best to kind of draw together everything that uh, you have said to come to an informed point of view at this question, which is whether or not we think collectively that there is an ethical way to watch porn. Um, we are trying to do things differently here at Tortoise. You're very, very welcome, and I do hope that you will feel confident to hold forth whatever your point of view is on this particular topic. And with that, over to Nikki. Thank you very much. Right, well, um, really important thing to say actually as well, that you are being filmed, there are cameras in the room. So if you've got a problem with being on a stream that's just going to go on YouTube, come up to me afterwards. I'm just to be really clear about that. Um, if you've got your phone on, you can turn them off as well, because they can interfere. Um, right, so this is a rhetorical question to start, but when is the last time that you paid for your porn? <laughs> Definitely something to think about. Do you check if you're watching a video that's being pirated? Ethical consumption of food and fashion and all manner of things has become so important to our society. But porn seems to be the thing that we still feel very self-conscious about, we're not able to discuss it very easily, and we don't know where to go for information about how to watch ethical if we want to watch ethical. So what we're going to try to do tonight is answer some of those questions. So, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, I have Alexa Vice over here. She's a self-proclaimed mattress actress <laughs> and a UCAP Adult Awards winner um, of 2017. Alexa is a well-established, multi-award-winning UK-based performer. Prior to working in the sex industry, she was studying law at Leeds University. She describes herself as a proud international cover model, and she produces her own content for subscription sites and performs for established production companies internationally. Overall, Alexa enjoys her career and is an out and proud sex worker. <laughs> um, to my left, I also have Sam, just Sam, for tonight. <laughs> Sam is a producer at Joy Bear Pictures and co-founder of Alt Ship. Um, Joy Bear Pictures, sorry, is a sex-positive erotic film production company, um, and they've been making high-end narrative feature films since 2003. And Sam's produced Joy, Be Joy Bear's films for nine years, alongside working in TV and online video production, and she creates queer alternative porn content as a co-founder of Alt Shift. And then I have to my right, Kate Isaacs. Kate is an activist and founder of the Not Your Porn campaign, that's hashtag, 
Uh, Kate started the campaign after a friend of hers fell victim to revenge porn and ended up on Pornhub without her consent. She is now fighting for regulation of the commercialised porn industry and investigating illegal activity within it, including child image-based <coughs> sexual abuse. And finally, again to my left, we have Neelam Taylor. Neelam is a freelance journalist with a focus on news, race, pop culture, sociology, environmental issues, politics and gender. She's worked with BBC Three, BBC World Service, Huffington Post and Unilad. She was cast in the BBC Three Porn Laid Bare series, investigating the porn industry where she interviewed porn performers, producers, campaigners, academics and whistleblowers, critically analysing each aspect of the industry in Spain. You might have seen it, I certainly have. She's also spoken on Victoria Derbyshire, Radio 1, BBC Radio 4 and Radio 5 Live on the topic of porn. So I think you will agree, we have a panel of people with a, a great range of expertise and lots of things to share with you tonight. So I'm going to try and set the conversation going by Sam asking you a question <laughs> about what we consider to be the definition of ethical porn. Is there such a thing, you work for Joy Bear Pictures, they use the phrase ethical to describe themselves or certainly used of them. What, what does that actually mean? I think that that's a really important question. What does ethical mean to everyone? And I think the general consensus in the public is that if it's shot beautifully and everyone is doing something that is really soft and gentle, that's ethical. And this is the biggest problem with this term ethical porn. I think that if something is low budget but everyone is treated well on set, that is still ethical. It's changing the perception of the public from seeing something that has to be beautiful and soft and that means that it was well made and that means everyone was treated well and everyone that was on that set. You don't know that. You don't know because it looks like a commercial that everything that went on behind the scenes is ethical. For me, making ethical porn is about everything that goes on throughout the whole process and it's about understanding that. So making ethical porn, I mean that's a longer conversation about whether we should be using that term anyway, is about treating people well, feeding people well, looking <coughs> after boundaries and sex tests and small things, catering, paying people well, but again that's a sliding scale, what does that mean? What does paying people well? Clarity, yeah, talking through with performers before what you're doing, but the biggest issue is that people, I'm generalising, see beautifully made porn where the woman is having real orgasms and is being treated well as ethical. A woman can be being slapped around and degraded to hell if she consented to it and was treated well and set, that is still ethical. Ethical is not what you're seeing, it's not the acts that you're seeing and it's not how it looks, it's not visually how it looks and it's not the acts that you're seeing, it's the other things that you're not perceiving that you need to go and do research on if you're going to understand what ethical porn is. Okay, so Neela, I'm going to bring you in actually because I think that ties in quite nicely. When you were working on Porn Laid Bare, yes. um, did you go in with any kind of concept of what it might be to make something that's ethical? Um, no, not really. I definitely went in just with my own experiences of watching porn. I watched a lot of porn between the ages of like 12 and 16. So I just went in with my own, you know, what I used to watch. I didn't really go in with any idea of what it was going to be like. Um, we met a lot of different producers, um, some who I don't think gave the performers enough kind of um, control over what they were doing. And then we met like Erica Lust, who seemed to give her performers a lot of um, control over what they were doing and seemed to do things in an ethical way and called what she was doing very ethical porn. And I saw it as much more ethical in uh, lots of senses, like um, to do with like sex tests that like you were saying, to do with um, performers kind of boundaries and things like that, and also to do with how they presented different people and sexualities, you know, racially it was very, it was coincidental, which was something unique for me, I'd seen, I'd only been on free porn tube sites um, where, you know, race is a really, um, like the main, they're the headline, you know, if someone's, it's a tick box, it's a category, it's the drop down menu, so when I saw her porn, I was actually, it was actually really refreshing to see 
different people with different sexualities, it was just coincidental, people different races, it was coincidental ages, everything, it was just, you know, it was much more about, um, it felt much more authentically just people and sex, which is a really beautiful thing. So, yeah, I, I think I did see a range of different, um, like, porn producers and stuff when I was there. Yeah, so you got a chance to think about what that might be and also what is possible yeah, to produce. Yeah, definitely, yeah, absolutely. Um, Kate, I'm going to bring you in because I think maybe some of what's already been said you might not agree with in terms of representation of certain acts. Do you think any sex act filmed can potentially be ethical? Ugh, I've literally been battling with this question for so long. Um, I think that consent is mandatory in any sort of ethical industry and I think if porn is completely consensual, and I'm not just talking about the original filming of it, but posting it and where it's shared. Um, if you are a porn worker or a sex worker, having complete control over where that content goes. Um, for example, if it's a paid for um, pornography film and then it ends up on a free tube site, therefore I don't believe that that consent then follows through because you have a consent to being on a, on a free porn website. I think the industry that exists at the moment, from my own research, is not ethical in the slightest and I think that's mostly to do with the massive monopolies uh, that exist within the industry and the tube sites and I think I'm kind of going on my own journey with this one and I think it'll be super interesting to hear more from the panellists but at the moment I think my opinion is definitely I'm not sure a porn industry can exist completely ethically at the moment whether that can be changed by people like the lovely people on my right, uh, left, then I, I don't know, but I think it should be super interesting to find out. But industry as it is at the moment, I do not believe is ethical at all, no. Okay, so that brings Alexa in really nicely. Alexa, what is your experience of performing or working in the industry? Do you feel that standards are not quite right, things could be improved? I, I work predominantly in the UK, but also in Europe and I've worked in the States. In the UK, and I would say in Europe mostly as well, it's so small that reputation is such a huge part of it. If you don't treat performers well, they know that. They know that going in there. They know that's a decision they make. Do I want to work with this company? Because I know what they're like. Um, so they're informed. And mostly, if you have a bad reputation, you're going to struggle to get performers. And you're going to fall on your ass, basically. Um, mm. I think keeping it small in the UK is, is important. Um, I think what you said was very interesting. The tube sites, I would say, are significantly less ethical than the production companies. Um, the tube sites are a constant battle to have content removed from them, um, which at the end of the day, I mean, I don't pay for the porn I watch. I'm going to be honest. You know, I go on the tube sites and I watch stuff, and you just think, well, I'm not going to keep making it if you're not going to pay me for it. People think we make this insane money. Don't get me wrong, we make good money, but not like it used to be because there's so much free stuff out there. Um, so really, the tube sites encroaching on what we create is, is a bigger issue than issues with production companies. Um, a lot of stuff these days is content that we make ourselves. Um, so that obviously gives you a lot of control over it. It doesn't give you the access to the same uh, platform and exposure, which is why we still work with production companies. Um, so I think paying for it is way up there as an important thing. Um, Raining the tube sites in somehow is an issue. I mean, Pornhub, MindGeek, some of these companies that own the internet, no one's ever heard of them. Most people outside of the sex industry have never heard of MindGeek. They own the age verification <coughs> rights. Um, they own half the internet. And no one knows who they are. Yeah. And it's a bit of an issue. Just a, uh, actually out of interest, does, everybody, does anybody in the audience know who MindGeek is? Have you heard of MindGeek? So it's about half and half, actually. So there's lots of, so there's a fair number of people that don't know who they are. And um, in general, when you're when you're watching porn, I'm presuming you're watching porn because you've come to this. Um, <laughs> do you again know who owns what you watch? Yeah, and yeah. So pretty much nobody knows what they're looking at, right? And I think that's across the board. Okay, fair enough. Um, so. I, I wanted to come back to you, Kate, actually, because I think your campaign, Not Your Porn, is really interesting. That comes from a point of somebody absolutely having content, private content, stolen when they themselves have no intention of it ever becoming porn. Right. So is, is that something that's very common? Uh, more common than I think any of us care to want to believe. Um, I started the campaign, uh, like you said, because a friend of mine ended up on Pornhub, and not only did she end up on Pornhub, but we asked them to remove it several times, and even told them that she was underage. And it got pulled, and it re-uploaded seven or eight times, and then hit the viral top five. Um, and 
it went completely viral, uh, millions, and she had never consented to that video being public, um, and someone had hacked her iCloud account to get it. So I sort of was slightly engaged with porn before, I think. I watched it myself. I, I probably didn't engage with it as much as some people here, um, but after doing a bit of digging and, and investigation into the current revenge porn laws that we have and things like that, found that it's actually a massive epidemic that no one's talking about because the victims don't want to talk about it. They've already had their privacy completely invaded and put on a porn website. Why would they want to continue having that conversation? They just want to shut that reputation down as soon as humanly possible. So it's this whole sort of underground category, which is probably not even that underground in, uh, in the grand scheme of things, but sort of disguised with these terms like revenge porn or leaked sex tapes or Snapchat stolen teen recordings. There's so many of them on these massive porn websites, and I've been dealing with My Geek and Pornhub for a number of months now, and I can tell you that they all know about it, and they don't want to do anything about it, because they make a hell of a lot of money from their ad sales. And I think the profitization of someone's lack of consent and the monetization of their sexuality without their consent is absolutely, I think it's one of the biggest sex crimes of, of this generation, and the fact that these porn companies like Mind Geek have such a massive um, pull on the industry, and they know these things are happening. Nikki mentioned the child image-based abuse. Some things I will never be able to unsee for the rest of my life. And they've got them up on their porn websites, and they're profiting from them. And companies like Unilever and Heinz only recently said that they'd pull their ads. So yes, I believe that there are porn workers and porn companies which are really striving to make the industry one of which everything is about consent and ethics, but actually at the moment, MindGeek is disputed as owning, uh, owning a massive monopoly of 80% of the commercialized porn industry globally. And so therefore at the moment they are the industry and they're acting this, this so brazenly are sort of doing exactly whatever the hell they want because there is no lack of, there's no regulation, there's no regulatory body, there's no one to hold them to account. Um, and they own such a massive chunk. So at the moment, I guess from my perspective, what I'm talking about, um, the industry in general, I know that they're not ethical because that 80% of it is not eth ethical in that respect. Um, and I think that does span over to sex workers as well. I know that, you know, having your content stolen that you've sort of made to make money and then have that stolen by a tube site, how infuriating. How many of us would be up in arms if someone tried to do that to us? Um, but I also think the fact that there are all these women, mostly women, and I say women because that's the experiences that I've had, are exploring this way of sort of communicating their sexuality, I'd actually be really interested to know how many people in this room have ever like taken a nude or sent a nude. <laughs> we, asked this question. we asked this question last time. Did you? It was about the same. Yeah. To people, and then there'll be some people that don't want to say, and that's fine. So yeah. I'll add them to the invisible. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the point, right? Like we're all doing it. No one's doing it as a sort of a, like a pseudo. Like it's not. It's not uncommon, and the fact yeah. that you, that nude could end up on a commercialised porn website all without your permission and consent and you can't do anything about it, I think is absolutely terrifying. So I think that is a given. I think everybody in this room, whatever you think about ethical porn, will completely agree that if somebody steals your content, that, that's your personal videos and you never intended it to go anywhere near a porn site, and that's completely wrong and totally unethical. But not just personal content, content that producers are making is being stolen. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And I think that really doesn't have the same emotional impact. No, like, no. That no, is, it's a, that's but it's definitely private. Alexis, carry on saying. Well, if you think that something, if you've put something out there to sell yourself, you know, obviously it undermines our income and it's incredibly frustrating and it impacts the industry, but if you've made something that was never intended to be public, that's going to have a huge emotional impact. Um, I have to say it's interesting to me that you said you found it so difficult to get stuff taken down because mm -hmm. I've never had a problem getting stuff removed off porn sites. There, there was one obscure site one time that was sneaky about it, but mm -hmm. Pornhub, I've always found, takes stuff down very quickly and I've actually had my friend's mum showed up in a video that um, she was not aware was on the <laughs> oh internet. Gosh. Yeah. Um, and I immediately contacted them and had it taken down for it. And I, f I found they are quite quick to remove it. And I think because they know that they shouldn't have it up there. <laughs> you think that. And I think a lot of workers, porn workers, actually feel the same way about Pornhub. When it comes to revenge porn, I think so called revenge porn. That is, re I'm sorry, I'm talking about revenge porn. Oh, really? Yeah. Quite I mean, I've worked with quite a few victims now over the last 
few months and the story tends to be the same. And because of that download function on websites like Pornhub, the fact that you can download it, it doesn't matter if it's up for like a minute or two hours or 24 hours. As soon as it's up, that's it. And well, you I was can download it and re-upload it. My friend's mum, I, I mean, it had like 40,000 views on it. And my, to her, obviously, that's mortifying. What I said to her was, I mean, I'm trying to get seen. And I've got, <laughs> you know, yeah. I've got 17 million views and most people still don't know. <laughs> so don't worry too much about the 40,000, but I also understand if you have no intention of that being public, principles. seeing that number there would be utterly horrifying. Mm -hmm. I've had sorry. So, sorry, I'm going to try and bring the audience in, because I realise that Agatha is ticking along quite nicely there. <laughs> We've probably spoken to any of you lot. Um, I can see the gentleman also to say. Yeah. Um, I see the problem is very similar to when Napster came into being. Um, and the solution there obviously was, was a drive towards paid for content and the best way to do that was digital rights management and I can see that being truly the only solution that we can go in this particular sector. Can you, can you explain digital rights I, management? I was just about to. <laughs> um, so digital rights um, is a way of encoding into the content that goes up that that is owned by someone. So whether it was a private content or whether it was commercial content, you can then track back immediately and go, actually, you don't own the rights to that and we're going to shut you down. So it's like an invisible watermark. It's exactly like an invisible right. watermark. Digital fingerprinting, is that the same thing? I know people in other industries who use it where they mark each video they sell individually so they can see exactly who is stealing their content. They can track back to exactly which subscriber has, sold their, has stolen their content. And that happens in films But I don't well. think in the porn industry people make creating their own content have that level of technical to, skill mostly. Well, I... I, I so the technology exists, but it's not been implemented. Well, I, the, the technology exists in, in every field, from music to film. I mean, to the point that when they issue from BAFTA, the screeners, they have it embedded in the screener, so they know exactly the individual that uploaded that. Um, so it can be applied. It's just, again, we're back to this, this huge conglomerates that aren't particularly interested in doing that. And, and until people like Google or Facebook or one of the other monopolies kind of go, right, we're not going to host Pornhub or we're not going to do RedTube or whatever it is, then I can't see how you, you spell it. But if one of those tipple, topples, then that would be something It's very easy to embed DRM. It's, it, it's, not, it's not a complicated task, um, but you just have to know how to do it. There's, a, com there's a company called Global who digitally fingerprint uh, porno pornographic content and Pornhub offer it uh, to victims of revenge porn to stop it from being uploaded. The problem is with that from a a uh, revenge porn perspective, and again, I use the word revenge porn caveated, it's probably not the best term to use, but they often require you to have the footage yourself to be able to upload it, and the victim would have to go through that process themselves. A lot of the time they don't have the original video, so they can't fingerprint it, but it does exist. So it would be really interesting to work out. The porn companies at the moment, specifically Pornhub, say that they can't digitally fingerprint content that's been uploaded to their website themselves because there's UK legislation that uh, prevents them doing so. That's not necessarily true. Um, I think it's more of a PR line. But it, it does exist. I think exposure of that and, and making digital fingerprinting a lot more known and mainstream would be a really interesting solution. So I, think, I just want to go back to this issue of, so we've definitely established what is not okay to watch. But at the same point, if you're an everyday consumer and you want to go online, you want to watch some porn, how on earth do you know? What signs can you look for, Sam? Um, from a production perspective, to have any inkling of whether the content you're watching is so-called ethical? I think this is the issue. We need to look at education of consumers, changing the way that they are consuming porn, and educating them on where they can pay for porn, where they can do research. And at the moment, it's really about individually going out there, looking at websites. There are plenty of them out there. And really speaking to producers and it's, this is the problem, it's difficult because anyone can use the word es ethical as a marketing tool and I feel like that it is used as a marketing tool a lot of the time. We are ethical porn, we are making ethical porn, there are headlines all over the place. But you can't, you can't know that, you can't know that your fair trade coffee is... I mean, it's usually applied to romantic porn. Yeah, you, which is what you were saying. To, is the first yeah, thing you I said was romantic it's like, it's isn't an necessarily it's ethical. It's generally an aesthetic issue. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, I tried once upon a time to create something called the Ethical Porn Partnership, which was a standard. It sounds terribly naive now, but it was meant to be a kind of fair trade equivalent for porn, and it didn't work at all. But I did have a go at it. 
But what I found when I was doing it was that it was nearly impossible to get people to agree on one set of ethical standards. I think you have to decide what your ethical standards are for your porn, and then you have to go on Twitter or social media and you need to engage with people producing porn, with performers, you need to understand who you like, what they're making, and whether, ask them, message them, ask them, how are you making your porn? Is it some way that you think is ethical. Neil, what do you think about this? Because you've obviously had experience of talking to lots of people yeah. about what exactly they were doing and how people were being looked after. Did you find that they were very transparent? Um, I feel like stuff that I was going to be shown when we were making porn wasn't, I didn't, you know, it's not necessarily going to be everything that they're doing. They are going to show us the kind of best part side of what <coughs> they're doing. Um, but for me, like, I think that the eth ethics of porn kind of comes down to three things, like ethical in terms of how are they treating performers, um, ethical in terms of what effect is it having on individual people watching it. So it's literally to do with like physical effects on the individual. Like, the reason I stopped watching porn was because um, when I was 16, I had my first relationship and I found that I couldn't get physically wet from real life sex, but I could watch in porn. So I was like, oh my God, I fucked up my body. Um, and so then I stopped watching porn because of that. And it was only after that that I started to educate myself more on the third thing, which I think is the societal effects that come from porn. So I think that's the, you know, the gender stereotypes, racial stereotypes, sexuality stereotypes that come from mainstream porn. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that those ethical porn would be porn that treats, that treatment of the people who make it is, um, you know, ethical. Um, I think that the, how the representation of different people in society um, and how that is, so I think a lot of niche um, porn production companies do that well and they represent different strands of society, different sexualities, different kinks and everything, um, but mainstream porn I don't think does do that, unfortunately <coughs> that's what most people watch. Um, and then in terms of on the individual, you know, that's got to be around education. Because young, you know, people watching at the age of 12, like I did, first thing I typed in when I got a laptop. And... that, you know, I don't know the difference between sex and porn, and that's an issue. If I'm 12 and I don't know the difference... You both mentioned education, and it's something I feel really strongly about. It's yeah. education. I feel like porn is scapegoat. It's so often with some people say, my son's got it's, it's like sex education from porn and it's terrible and, and that's porn's fault and you go well no you kind of fucked up as a parent <laughs> yeah. like, you you need to educate your child on yeah. the fact that porn exists educate your child on the fact that it's extreme mm. that you know that people are maybe consenting and enjoying it there but maybe not doing it all the time outside of work that your 16 year old girlfriend isn't going to be able to swallow your dick balls deep <laughs> <laughs> like, that, that education is really really yeah. important yeah. Um, and you can't scapegoat it and you, you can't avoid it you're not going to get rid of it so educate people. Yes. Okay, I'm going to bring this to the audience because I can still see people really want to start talking now. This thing here. Yeah. So I thought that was a really good point because I think it's obviously clear that you can, well, I don't know how anyone can ever argue that if porn is not consensual, it's not going to be ethical. But I'm interested to see what, you go, what people think going beyond that, like what's the impact that porn is having. So for example, if it's a film which is promoting a very sexist view of women, is that ethical to watch, even though the woman is consenting to it? Because what's the impact of that of that porn on the general population? Is it going to make certain men think that's the way women are, and is that necessarily good or not? I don't I don't really know, and that's what I'm interested to maybe talk about. Like, is it ethical to watch porn, which even though everyone's consenting, is promoting a view of um, men or women that isn't necessarily right? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to bring in Thomas. Sorry, I need to ask some more questions. But let's carry on. Go for it. Um, I, I would uh, disagree, so I, I think that whether uh, porn is ethical or not has nothing to do with what's on screen. It's everything to do with you know, pay and how the performers are treated, if uh, things are consented and so on. Because I think the danger now is kind of stereotyping a certain kind of porn as in uh, a bit alternative, uh, a bit more colourful, and then thinking, okay, that's good, and then the, all the other is bad, and it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's at the end of the day, it's a fantasy, it's fiction. So, um, if it has an impact on society, then it's a it's a matter of education, and it's a completely different matter. But it, 
I think it's dangerous uh, to say, well, it's just bad if we if you look at uh, like a, a you know BDSM porn because even if uh, people consent to it, it's it's going to have a, a, a bad effect on society. That's so, so one of the issues that we have, and I presume you're advising here, is that fantasy itself, what we fantasise about, could technically be ethical or not ethical. So, are we saying that desire is amoral or not? Is desire amoral or should desire be within the confines of moral judgement? Yes, I can see your face looking puzzled. It's tricky. It's tricky. Can I in really quickly? And this is off the record for anyone recording this, but... Um, <laughs> to having those feelings, that man had those feelings. The reality is he probably didn't have an eight-year-old daughter, it was probably completely made up. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> the audience. Right, so there are definitely some things that it's not okay to do. We accept that. Are there some things that it's not okay to fantasise about? Oh, I'm in trouble if there are. Yeah. <laughs> who, who, believes, oh who genuinely believes there are things it's not okay to fantasise about? I used about? to. I have to say, I used to have... Oh, I'm genuinely sorry. asking. I'm genuinely asking. Anyone? It's Charlie Fighter. Yeah. Do you think it's, there are certain things that are not okay to fantasise about? I, I don't anymore. I don't anymore. I've come to terms with it. <laughs> but the point is that people do have fantasies that are not... That if they were actions would not be okay, but they're fantasies. So this is where it starts to get really difficult with the ethics, right? There are studies, though, that show that um, so paedophiles actually having child sex dolls, which we all immediately go, ugh, you shouldn't make child sex dolls, but actually the evidence suggests that child sex dolls prevent okay. offending. Yeah. Well, there's, um, there's so, evidence on both sides, but yeah, okay. that, that's but there is very controversial. So it's the same about. issue, though. It's kind of... Mm -hmm. um, there's th there, we all have dark, dark fantasies, but can you... you I mean, you could, society tried to suppress hom homosexuality for a long, long time. Didn't work. <laughs> you know, your sexuality is your sexuality, and it may be a deviant sexuality that you may not actually want any part of, but you cannot just suppress a person's sexuality. So to find an outlet that's safer for them, I think that's really dangerous to compare homosexuality. Oh, no, I, I don't think there is a history. No, as in like, no, I appreciate the point, and I think, but I think it's worth articulating just because I think yeah. no, there, there are many groups who use it as an too. example. Right. Yeah. Think yeah. if it's two consenting adults, very, very different story to if you're fantasizing about. Yeah. A child. My only point was you cannot suppress a person's sexuality. That okay, if so society that, labels right. it deviant, although I don't consider homosexuality deviant, of course, but if society labels it deviant, that doesn't actually change people's sexual desire. So <coughs> people will have some fantasies no matter what. what yes, yeah, they'll saying. have some sexual inclinations. And and inclinations they'll though. go outside the realms of what other people find acceptable, and this is, sure. that, that's the problem, is that when you start going, okay, we're going to create a morality, whose morality is it? But I think the general morality around things like paedophilia is 
the ability yeah. to do with consent, isn't it? Consent is going to be like an absolute. Well, Fantasizing about. I mean, there was a great play called The Nether that dealt with that perfectly. Fantasizing about paedophilia and actually they should be performing different the words. act. Two separate things completely. Okay. Well, what about okay. commercializing it? Commercialising what fantasy? But yeah. Just commercialization yeah. of, of commercialization of fantasy of having sex with underage children. Oh, okay. well, hold hold that because I'm going to bring this lady in. Yeah, I had a discussion with someone about this recently about uh, what some people call pseudo child pornography or teen porn, uh, where it's an adult acting as a child in a pornography, and whether or not that is inherently unethical or not. And my argument was, well, someone watching this who maybe doesn't have uh, sexual desire for children at the time, watching this, they may start to develop an interest in it, and they may then seek out uh, actual child pornography, and that may lead to uh, actual um, offending um, against you children. And, um, but this person was saying, well, if someone already has this desire, maybe this is a way that they can get their fantasy fulfilled without actually causing harm to someone. Um, or alternatively, it may be that the person is watching this not out of a desire to uh, have sex with children, but rather out of a desire for um, some kind of, uh, like, desire for uh, returning to a state of childhood. No or Yeah. yeah. Um, and I find that really difficult. I mean, personally, I think that there is a limit to, because I think people are impacted by the media that they see. I mean, social learning that we imitate what we see, um, but I can understand why it may be beneficial to some people. Um, so I'm, I'm curious what other people think about that. I'm going to bring in this idea. Um, I think the difference is when we say we talk about fantasizing whether it's ethical or not. If it's in your own head and you don't talk about it, you don't produce anything, and you don't share anything, I would say, well, yeah, go, go do whatever you need to do. But the research I've seen is that as soon as you consume porn, for example, that's centering on children, that lowers people's inhibitions. So the best research we know of now, I think it comes out of the Netherlands, where they run clinics that try to target ped pedophiles. And what they find is that they basically need to get to them before they have consumed any child pornography, because once they've done that, that sort of lowers their inhibitions, it breaks the social taboo, and it very much gives them a desire to act on it, because they've seen it modeled. And if that is your orientation, which it does seem to be sort of biologically quite hardwired to mm -hmm. want to do that, I don't know if I will say that everyone has a right to have their fantasy fulfilled. I, it's a contentious issue within the industry, certainly. It's not something that people, performers and producers, editors just go, oh yeah, we're totally fine, we're doing this. <laughs> but it's something that's constantly debated within the industry, I think. But we're avoiding the fact that Hollywood makes films of oh, horrible I mean, slash and murder, and we don't go out and say that that, we're blaming porn and we're not putting it in the same bag as entertainment as general. It's fantasy, it's entertainment. Horror movies show horrific things that are much more horrific than generally what you're ever gonna see in porn. And we don't go, that murder generally is made by I'm being really uneloquent right now. You know what I'm trying to get at? Yeah. People don't Somebody scapegoat finishing. Hollywood in the same way that scapegoat porn. People don't the same way that porn is constantly... So we basically have a division there in terms of which way... Yeah, sorry, did you just want to... I mean, I don't know where I sit on that one. To respond to that, it's different if you're tying sexual arousal to it and you're conditioning people to be sexually aroused. I mean, I felt... I thought I know a performer who initially was not shooting as performing as a very underage character, shall we say, and she transitioned into doing that, and I felt that that was very irresponsible. Personally, I felt like that encourages people. Like you're saying, somebody up here said, you know, you're initially attracted to a person, and then that person starts acting a, as a character that's underage. That's causing people who didn't have feelings and inclinations towards being attracted to underage people. It's kind of dragging them into that. Um, and there was certainly a line as well. The character she was portraying was, was of a, an age that could not consent. You know, that's not, oh, um, you know, year 11 school student, that kind of thing. He wasn't like college kid. It was like, mm -hmm. this is this could potentially be offending. And I felt, personally, I wasn't at all keen on what she was doing. However, I do feel like... If the, we're going to please porn, we have to please Hollywood the same way. The, there is a very good point for saying that we are criticised in a way that other industries aren't. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, um, yeah, maybe to uh, sort of interrelated point about because there was a point made very briefly about sex education, and I think that's really interesting because, like, 
I read an article a while back about Pornhub doing sex education on their site, and I was a bit like, oh, how do I feel about this? I'm not really sure. I'm like, do I think you're part of the problem, and then also you're trying to find right. a it's bit like of a solution? Cigarettes send people to, I don't know, long cancer clinics? <laughs> <laughs> not really. Yeah, a little well, bit. Or any time an old company says they're doing renewables, you know, that kind of thing. Like, um, but it's... Uh, like, 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 just give them a second to finish. Um, but yeah, no, I find, I find that interesting. I think it kind of feeds in. Someone made the point about sort of repressing homosexuality, not being open about things and I feel like that's generally characteristic obviously a lot less so now than maybe 50 years ago but I feel like that's very characteristic of society like we're not open about it like I don't know what it's been about 15 years since I did any sex education but I remember it being atrocious and I'm sure it probably it's still is it's um, and I like there are places for instance I've got a friend who grew up in in America and she was saying because of the locality like the way that schools are funded if you live in, as she did, in the heavily Catholic area, there was zero sex education and shockingly an incredibly high rate of teen pregnancy. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but I find that really interesting. I'm like, is, is there a broader problem that, you know, if we were able to be more open about this, if there were greater education, if, um, you know, if, if children were receiving that education, or even to be a little bit controversial, if people were more able to be open about a sexual orientation that we don't feel is moral, um, then maybe they could get help to move them away from that. But at the moment, it's like obviously, you know, we're very close about it. Like, we have no education. Like, is it this sort of feedback loop? Sure. Does anybody here, has anybody here either heard of people having education about porn or ever had it themselves as part of sex education? I just get sent all the kids. Okay. Everyone sends their kids to me. <laughs> and so a couple of people, but not very many. So it sounds like there is a massive education problem there. Um, somebody else had their hand up over here. Can I just say really, really quickly, the yeah. difference between Hollywood and pornography is that people are educated and aware that Hollywood is fake or fantasy. Are they? And they are not. They know that we don't have colonies in space. They know they're watching a fantasy <laughs> film, exactly. right? <laughs> but when they watch porn, they haven't been educated that that's fantasy. Right. And that, I think, is where the issue lies. And to do with the not talking about it. Yeah, it's, well, I mean, I, so I have, I've spoken to two 14-year-old children who were sent to me for, well, you seem to be sexually active, but, you know, and neither of them knew what an STD was. Having done primary and secondary sex education, neither of them knew what an STD was, let alone porn education. Mm -hmm. And so the reason people were able to watch Hollywood films and have that separation, and they know they're watching fantasy. Kids do not know, when they watch pornography, that it's a performance. They don't know. Is so porn a drug? You can become um, desensitised, I think, but you have to hold personal responsibility. And if you could be educated on the fact that you can become desensitised by watching it too much and using too powerful toys, you know, when I'm using a main street, a mains powered wand and I'm searching torture, back away from the porn. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know, I take some time to get back in touch with myself and I go back to it because I'm aware of what's going on, but people are not. Again, educated right. on it. Let me bring some more of the audience. This gentleman. So what does it feel about something that the gentleman down there said about mm -hmm. like, the greater role of society and all this stuff, Spe but specifically pornography, maybe? So like when sustainable tourism, which is like a massive problem that you said earlier, that we're better at other industries at picking up ways where I think that I'm not sure, that we're better at pointing them out, but I'm not sure how good we are at really right. acting on them, like acting on clothing and acting on mm -hmm. the food industry. And like sustainable tourism, for example, like the Duke of Sussex, Prince Harry, has got this new venture called Travel List where they're getting like sea trip visa, some huge names together to set an industry standard, um, which they can then put to the consumer and the we will act on that. Um, for travelling, did you for, say? For sustainable tourism, yeah. Sustainable exactly. tourism, okay. But like for porn, where we're, we're all here because we have a consumer working porn, but we still never really talk about it outside places like this room. And until we can have that honest conversation and then the champions that come from that that help us reverse engineer the decision for the consumer, how do you get, like, unless porn is on your side, right? How do you spark the outrage in the right places to get the conversation move forward? I don't think there, there is much conflict between, um, we say the sides, no, no. though we're on opposing sides, but I think we can, we can all sure, agree that revenge porn is a yeah, yeah, um, I think we all kind of actually have similar goals, really. Sure. Um, this gentleman. Um, this is a slightly different tack to this whole thing. Um, I don't 
I mean, I've learned a lot from this little book there. I didn't know that's Pornhub. So, so my feet owns Pornhub? Yeah, Mindfeet. Mind yeah. Feet. Sorry, Mindfeet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Although more appropriate name. Mindfeet is good, yeah, I like that. Uh, and they answer they have this massive monopoly. Right. I don't understand, just to go to a bit of an extreme, what that, if they just put a filter on and said, we have to check every single thing that gets uploaded, what incentive do they have not to do that? Well, advertising mm -hmm. money. It costs yeah. a lot of money to check it. It costs so much money. They only have six but human moderators at Pornhub, can I just say? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so let's but say they spend some money, <laughs> they hire some it. people, it costs them money. Right. Would they not expect more advertising revenue and more collaboration from people and, and to be this pinnacle? They've obviously sat there as a company. Someone internally has said, should we do this or should we not? And I just don't understand all these arguments for not doing it. So I think unless we identify what their arguments are. They make a lot of money from those types of videos. Types of videos which show a lack of consent in some sort of way, or like a leak set tape from a celebrity, a lot of hits, which equal ad, ad revenue, essentially. But I, I feel like people would still go to it, even if this stuff disappeared. What's Pornhub? Yeah. Uh, maybe. But I mean, that's not really the point, is it? It's the implications of the cost and the revenue return. So you're, you're asking them to spend billions for no real apparent reason from their perspective. Well, I mean, the apparent reason is morality, that's his ethics, that's why we're here. Thanks, just one minute, yeah, carry on. Oh, sorry, I just can't, I can't see, this may be overly simplistic, but people are going to Pornhub for a very specific purpose. Um, is that purpose not satisfied if they remove this content? That purpose is still there. Will they really lose half their consumer base? No, but they'd have to hire a hell of a lot more staff to look regularly. But, but, so, there so, are so verified the pages. Is, they just need to fill that balance, that balance on the revenue sheet. So the, the question is, they just need to be assured of that advertising revenue. They just need to be assured of that money to make up that difference in order to tackle 80% of the problem do you see what I mean? I do, I do, I do see that. what you mean. I do see what you mean. I mean, like Mia, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just wondering, so are we in agreement then that clicking on Pornhub because of these practices, even if you yourself are choosing ethical things within Pornhub, by giving them your clicks, that in and of itself is unethical? Absolutely. Okay, mm -hmm. so by not paying for your porn, <coughs> I'm going to There are some verified sites on Pornhub. This is what I was going to say, yeah. You could go. go you, no, you do this. Well, as a consumer, you could go to the verified pages, and but then, then you're still giving your at your money to Pornhub, who. I, I see your point there, but I mean, yeah. you're probably also going out on a weekend and giving your money to Coca-Cola to have your vodka in it. <laughs> you know, they're not a bet ethical company. You probably shop at Amazon. You probably shop at Starbucks. Probably use an iPhone. Oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. There's problems everywhere, so you can. The best you can do is. You know, make sure you throw your litter in the bin and you recycle your glass and you go to the verified porn. And pages. pay for your porn. Right. And pay for the porn. Yeah, so. Like, like, verified okay. pages, the model makes money from. So, yeah. sorry, but then so does MindGeek. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, I just, I, I generally don't feel like if the company is profiting from things like. Well, oh, personally, I don't shop porn. at Starbucks, so I get your point. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, think, I think the point that um, you tried to make, Alexis tried to make is that all industries on a level yeah. in capitalism have a problem with them, whether it's the cobalt that's in your phone that's been mined or. You know, maybe the dairy that you're drinking. I'm not saying that you are, but you know, <laughs> the, there, are, there are deep, deep ethical issues with everything sure. we consume. Yeah, but this just happens to be very personal. So yeah, I mean, but I also about the person. It was sure. I, mean, I, I think, nice I think it's those the industries, and they might be not regulated very well, but they're still regulated. Well, they're Born, not regulated. They're still barely regulated. They still do bad <laughs> things, but at least there's someone bloody looking for it. Do you know what I mean? Like, even if if we flag something, at least someone's trying to do something about it. In the porn industry, there's no one that protects the models. There's no one that protects the. Um, the people who are not on there, you know, no one's looking at these porn companies and checking to see if they are working ethically. Regulations are interesting because most of the regulation brought in in the UK does absolutely nothing to protect performers, does absolutely nothing to protect the viewer and simply yeah, attacks the economy of the, yeah. the business side of it. Okay, so another question. Mm -hmm. Do we trust the government to regulate porn? <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Do we trust the government full stop? Full stop. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is another question. Yeah. Um, the, because obviously, you know, if you were told that some some content came with kind of government stamp of approval, this stuff is safe to watch, would you watch it? Yeah, because we do it with me. We do it with other things. Would we ever do it with porn? But every time they've tried it, like, you know, they, they, the, the, the last time where they said you can't enjoy female pleasure on, on screen. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, 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 the end said, are we going to verify all porn sites? But, so this is my point about it does nothing to protect the performer or viewer. So you are legally allowed to watch squirting, um, and you are legally allowed to squirt. What you can't do is film and host it in the UK. Yeah. So it doesn't protect the performer or the viewer. The most interesting one was actually that you could pretend to drink urine, and you could have the, the viewer believe you were drinking urine, <laughs> but you could not, in fact, drink urine. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows. So, <laughs> Because it, that might be quite <laughs> <laughs> but like, my point is Everybody just that none that of it was... actually impacts what you're allowed to watch or what sure. you're allowed to do, just the filming and hosting. But there was, was some regulation point. that came out, it was probably about two years ago, that said that a, a bunch of things were going to be banned, even if they weren't banned physically to do. That's just for some But context. you could watch them. You could watch you them as long as they're hosted somewhere else. If so the viewer isn't protected. Yeah. And they were very aimed at female pleasure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and that is a... There but I mean, no the, the reason I bring up that one, though, although it's quite a you know, controversial example, the reason I bring that up is because the fact that you were allowed to make it look like you were doing it. Yeah, so it's like, so the viewer believes you're doing it, so the viewer's not protected, and the viewer can watch a genuine example that's hosted somewhere else, and that's completely legal. Like, it never actually regulates testing or, um, you know, it, it never regulates anything that's there to protect the performer, and nothing, there's very few things the viewer cannot watch so long as they're hosted somewhere else. Yeah, I think so it's so bad what, regulation. What we're beginning to realise is that regulation isn't very good, and there's nobody really supporting us to do the ethical thing. Would we agree with that? Yeah. This guy at the back. Yeah, I actually like the gentleman in front of me. Uh, I, I thought we had, had an interesting idea. I think I think regulation is not going to work uh, because one, it's too of a top-down official measure to be able to tackle something so fluid and evolving and um, not talked about as. as but it's also jurisdictional, and so there's no way you can, even if we get one government to agree with one, we all of them to agree. And if all of them don't agree, there's always going to be the one country that allows you to show squirting, and then of course all the squirting videos are going to be but, I mean, there are... from Sorry. wherever they may be. But I think the thing that fascinates me about porn is that um, the monopoly aspect of it, mm -hmm. how it's both kind of a uh, fun dinner topic. Um, but also, <laughs> also, I want to go to your dinner. Yeah, I was gonna, um, <laughs> the dinners I go to. Uh, but but it's also sort of the idea of it's both an excuse and an explanation in a, in a, in, a, in a weird way because if eighty percent of porn or certainly online porn is owned by a single, single company, well, actually, hold on, that means I only have to talk to one person to affect change. And but I think what we need is some sort of there just isn't any, any impetus to actually have uh, a business conversation about this because the current model, which is only, which is probably like less th than 10 years old, really, whenever the dip in DVD sales and the rise in tube sites happen, it, it's actually quite recent. Um, it's kind of working for, for them business wise. They must have found out a way to churn enough money around. Um, and so I don't know, do we need, do we need like a whistleblower? From within, sort of, I, I'm the I'm the one who takes minutes at all the mind geek board meetings, and Jesus Christ, let me tell you what I know. <laughs> I think I think we need something like that to actually shine light into those board meetings. I think it is a private company. We have no idea of what they're thinking, what they're doing. Virtual reality porn. We kind of thinking that that's going to be the next big thing. Is it? Is it not? I think we need. There needs to be a big spark, and that spark I don't think is going to happen from the government. I think it's like catching Al Capone using taxes rather than his crime. I think if you're going to instigate change in mine, not what was it, my mind league, league. Uh, you are, it's, I mean, with all due respect, I think the ethics and the morality might not be the thing that changes their mind. It might be the money. Well, can I just, can I, can I just bring Sorry. a bit? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, but on the consumer side, if you look at it as a supply-demand thing, I think part of the problem is it's so private, or seemingly so, because obviously they're taking their data. But um, as a consumer of it, like, whereas a year ago I could show up to spin class with a plastic bottle, today I can't, mm -hmm. and that's great. Like, the, the consciousness has changed, and you're kind of publicly shamed for using plastic. Mm -hmm. and, and that's never going to happen with porn, and so I think it's just... And part of the other problem is, you know, plastic, like, we can see the oceans. You, um, it's a very clear uh, consequence, whereas the consequences of 
uh, they're, they're very nebulous. Like, you know, they are, are grave, but nevertheless, like, it's really hard to pinpoint what's wrong with those companies, and so it's hard to wear, wait, raise awareness. Can I chime in on this point? Yes, because I've had quite a few dealings with my geek, and I have tried your uh, uh, example no, of trying to sort of go in there and, and highlight all of this stuff and be like, hey, look at all of this evidence that you were hosting all of this material, what are you going to do about it? And they just deny it over and over and over again. Honestly, the most frustrating damn company in the world. And so the way that we got to them, because we wanted to <coughs> shout out to these lovely ladies in the front who have been helping me uh, and giving their own free time for it, but sort of going in and, and regulation was something we wanted to enforce because we knew that they weren't going to do anything about it themselves. And when you've got a company that owns 80%, what other industry would we allow a monopoly of 80%? Like, I mean, 80%, like, that's bar Globally, that's, like, disgusting. And I think my geek are very, very adamant that they don't have a problem even when you pre present them with the evidence. And I think their complete lack of morality is very, like, demonstrative of that as well. I'm not sure that we're being fair in accusing them of having this 80% monopoly in that they, I must say, that they do have their hosting model pages that they are paying you know, they, they are a hosting platform as well. So when we produce content and we host it on a platform and they take a cut of it, some of that 80% is actually Models' own pages that they are selling videos right. to. So although they are the umbrella of that, it's not quite... I feel like they're being represented as owning 80% of porn and... Traffic, yeah. You know, I, I, actually, they're kind of the hosting platform of a lot of that. Okay, we're really running out of time. I want to bring in some people that haven't spoken. Yes, sir. I'd literally just say one thing, which is we're in kind of an election in the US where monopoly power is very much part of the agenda. And it seems to me if you can try and get to the people who are pushing the message around your kind of Facebooks and Amazon, MindGeek's very much part of the story. Um, and then in the UK context, I kind of draw parallels between drugs and porn, where people are consuming something that they know is short-term fun for them, but they're doing very much at the same time as known societal issues. And in the case of drugs, uh, there's been attempts, but poorly done, to depoliticise them by setting up independent commissions. And it seems to me this is one where two issues where we need a wider conversation as a society. And that means, it means I would trust the government to regulate it if they kind of had depoliticised it we had had those conversations and we were talking about it in schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so there's three things that would need to happen. Sorry, I want to marry your... Sorry, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I want to marry your point about my geek being an umbrella and your point about monopolistic power. We're about to have a ton of deep fakes come to the UK very soon mm -hmm. and the responsibility <coughs> is going to be on the platform holders. It's going to be on them to sort it. I was shocked to hear there are six people. That has to be expanded. And when there's going to be the inevitable issue in the UK in three years' time, when a female politician is going to be on that site, faked, it's going to be on that company to sort it. It's yeah. going to have to be. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting we're talking about deep fakes um, because you know that's an actual problem that everyone seems to be really concerned of. But actually, no one's looking at the fact that there's a bunch of real videos of real <laughs> people who haven't consented to being on websites <laughs> now. Super interesting. Okay, I want to bring in anybody that hasn't spoken yet. Matt. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Matt. I'm an editor here at Twitter. Um, it's interesting because um, listening to this, and uh, obviously I'm spending a lot of my time at the moment co covering What's the election. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't <laughs> uh, But if you, if you listen to it and you, you're talking about an issue that is worth huge sums of money, it doesn't get to the performers, but you know the, 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 the industry is, as I understand it, bigger than the film industry now in terms of its potential scale. But certainly huge amounts of money are involved, OK? Um, it's driven by monopolies or duopolies. Um, the scale is, you know, almost beyond our comprehension. Um, and we've already established in this thinking that the behavioural impacts and the reach of this are extraordinary... Um, but also completely unclear. We don't know for sure whether it suppresses criminal behaviour or encourages it. We don't know whether um, you know, the, the, the impact upon young people is matched by, well, we do know it's not matched by uh, sensible sex education. Uh, and that's without even getting to the all-important question of how performers are treated and so on. And it seems to me that what the problem here is that the whole... Thing pre is presupposed by a sort of private snigger. Mm. You know, until this subject is 
is allowed truly into the realm of public policy discussion so that without a snigger, it can be discussed in Parliament. And without a snigger, it can be discussed at a manifesto launch. Absolutely. And without a snigger, mm -hmm. it can be discussed on question time. None of this is really going to be get us anywhere because the issues are, you know, really serious. Hey, we know porn is not going to go away. We we also know that it's changing dramatically, and we need to do serious um, intellectual heavy lifting research and so on to understand more and more about it. Mm -hmm. and it's fantastic that pe people like yourselves have come here and talked openly about it. But it's a drop in the ocean, isn't it? So I just think some, the, the, my takeaway from this is that the, there must be a way of removing that sort of initial snigger that, not in this room, I have to say, but in most discussions about porn, there's a kind of furtive chuckle. And until we get away from that, I think it can be very hard to answer the questions that we're addressing. I mean, is it, so is it an well, age thing? I, I was going to say address it. Because if you look around, like everybody here besides you and me is young. Um, <laughs> You're young. <laughs> um, so maybe it's just a question of like in Waiting 10 years' for that time when like everybody's like, every millennial's going to admit watching yeah. porn, right? If yeah. in the sex education that children go through, then maybe they're going to have less of a reaction when they get older and they just go to porn. Yeah. yeah. Well, because I feel like porn, sex education right now covers reproduction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Yeah. So, you know, it's not about sexuality, it's not about health and safety, and it's not about pornography, it's not about consent. It's just, yeah. here's some ovaries and sperm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, well, on that note, we're going to have to end. Oh. That went so quickly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm going to give you a really quick sum up of everything we saw, managed to talk about. Gosh, that was a lot. Right, so we started out by trying to define what is ethical porn. I don't know if we succeeded, but we did have a go. Um, Neelam gave us some really interesting insights into uh, experiences that, that she had on set and was talking to other people that were producing content and um, how they were treating their performers and what they thought themselves about ethics. She also made a really valuable point that race is a very uh, thorny issue and that it's treated as a tick box, box exercise for lots of people. Um, Kate made the really important point that consent is mandatory. Without it, you can't have anything that's ethical. Um, and that one of the biggest problems is the uh, control over the content, even if we do have co uh, consent between performers. Um, also, a really important point that the porn industry is actually quite small in Britain, um, but with the tube sites, it's too easy for them to steal content and for us to kind of lose control of where it goes. Um, what else did we talk about? Oh, so we were talking about digital rights management, really important thing that we need to kind of stamp the content so we can see who's consuming it, where it's going, the trail, we need a trail on it. Um, we talked about the education of consumers, that was Sam's point, talking about how um, in order to watch ethical porn we need to know what that is and we also need to be taught about it. We're not taught about it because we're not taught about sex education in a kind of healthy way. I think everybody agreed on that. Um, then we had a debate about fantasy. Um, is it okay to fantasise about anything you want? I think we were very divided on that issue. Thomas made the point that he thought that fantasy is fantasy, but I know that was very contentious once we got into the issue of underage children and paedophilia, which always is going to be contentious, but rightly so. Um, and Kate and Alexa shared some quite harrowing stories from their uh, own work. Um, and then, yeah, we came, back to, we came back to the issue of sex education, that without it, if you don't know what an STI is, if you don't know the difference between porn and sex, you're not going to be able to have uh, any kind of insight whatsoever as you get older. Um, very important point that Kate made about there already being six human moderators at MindGeek. Uh, or Pornhub, beg your pardon, which just seems incredible. It seems similar to the issue about Facebook and their lack of moderators, right. perhaps. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, we moved on to the topic of whistleblowers. Do we need a whistleblower, perhaps? And that person, do they come from inside the industry? Government, it seems, is not going to regulate porn, and not, none of you seem very keen on the idea of government stamped porn anyway. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that's certainly not going to happen anytime soon. Deep fakes a very pressing, kind of sexy issue to talk about and something that lots of people are really interested in with regards to porn and other kinds of videos. Will that be the issue that finally pushes us to a point of really deciding what is ethical and what isn't? And um, finally, Matt made some really good kind of summation there, talking about the fact that we hadn't really got to <laughs> some of the core issues that would have helped us <laughs> figure out this issue of ethics. So thank you so much for joining us tonight and for sharing so openly and I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you.